You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is April 13, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, physical urticarias. Our presenter is Dr. Sunina Argo. She's an allergy immunology fellow at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. So welcome to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is April 13th, and it's actually Friday the 13th, but Mm -hmm. we don't believe that that will uh, have anything to do with the luck of this program. I I suspect this will be a very lucky program. Um, We have two conferences today, and these are our first two conferences that are available for online CME, Continuing Medical Education Credit, which means that some of the People who are viewing this may be viewing it as a video after the conference is over. And for six months after this conference, it's possible to watch the video, do the pre- and post-test questions, answer a survey, and get CME credits for having done so. Um, If you have any comments or thoughts about this process, please send them to us. We'd be happy to to hear your concerns or your your favorable comments, your your lauding and your compliments. We We love those, too. Uh, but, but certainly we want to make this as useful as, as possible. Uh, the two conferences we have today are the first two that are available for online CME. Um, very shortly, we're going to start talk about doc, uh, physical urticaria, Dr. Sunina Argo. At 11 o'clock, Dr. Randy Rosenwasser is going to review particle deposition in, in small airways. Okay, <clears throat> well, we're not going to delay any further. Our first presentation is Dr. Sunina Argo. Dr. Argo is a first-year fellow in allergy immunology here at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics, and she's agreed to talk with us this morning about physical urticaria. So let me pull up your slides. Here's your keyboard and your mouse. So welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Arga. Okay, thank you. I don't think I put a slide in here, but I don't have anything to disclose in in this uh, conference. So I'll start out with, since this is our first CME conference, CME questions. Um, I'll just let you guys take a look at these, and then we'll go over them at the end of the talk. Mm. Oh, aquagenic urticaria. I had a patient with that one. I know. I was hoping you might be able to add a tidbit during okay. that. And then final question. Okay. All right. So these are the objectives that um, I was asked to cover. So to define the corticaria, um, be able to describe the appropriate testing to diagnose them, and then also to provide a management plan for patients with physical urticaria. So just a little introduction. Physical urticarias account for about 17% of chronic urticarias. The estimate in children is about 1 to 10%. Uh, They can actually coexist with each other, so patients can have two, three types of physical urticarias at the same time. Um, Unlike other types of urticaria, physical urticarias are usually longer lasting and remission is less common. Really, we don't know the pathogenesis for most of the types of physical urticaria. Uh, The thought is that the mast cell is just has heightened sensitivity to environmental conditions um, but we'll go through as we talk about each different type and talk about some of the proposed mechanisms of why these physical urticarias are occurring. So in terms of making the diagnosis, it's really important to understand the relationship between the pathophysiology and the actual stimuli. Um, this can really help with diagnosis, and if, if you can give patients you know, the triggers and the diagnosis, uh, you can help them know again, with a, how to avoid things, and you also will be able to understand which therapies might be more effective as there are some differences between physical urticarias and how they're treated. So when you're talking to patients, the, you want to ask them about their environmental exposure, physical stimuli. Timing of onset, I found, was a lot more important um, in terms of how long, when they come on, whether it's within minutes, whether it's delayed, and it's relatively easy, easy to understand once they're broken down into the physical urticarias 
because they're named appropriately, but that really is something that I don't know if we ask frequently. Um, and then duration, how long they last. We do ask this a lot, and we always are you know, making sure that they're less than 24 hours. But sometimes even being more specific about that might help you uh, determine what type of urticaria the patient's having. And then, of course, you want description of lesions. So we all know what hives are like, and we have a, a sort of a standard definition. But not every type of physical urticaria presents as the classic erythematous raised wheel. Um, so that's important. And then you want to know if there's any other associated symptoms that are going on. Again, just something that might help you hone in on the diagnosis. You know what I've found is that patients are particularly uh, unable to describe what hives look like because they don't have the vocabulary to describe a rash. Right. But what, what a lot of people do now is they bring in right. their cell phone and they show you a picture of it. Yeah. It's really helpful. And I've had several patients email me pictures, and I think that that really helps because a lot of times when you see patients, they don't have anything on their skin at the time. It's just this history. Right. Um, so I think that's definitely helpful. And this is another place where I think um, urticaria, like a diary, would be helpful because they may not remember exactly how long, you know, the, what, how long the onset was or when it resolved, how many hours. So keeping a diary may help kind of hone in on a pattern. The history may not be that reliable if they're trying to recall what it was like and they hadn't really thought about the questions you're asking. You're asking. Exactly. So once you've asked them, now they can go back and maybe try to come up with more accurate information. Absolutely. So one of the references that I um, looked through did a really good job, I think, of breaking these down into categories and help you think about these a little bit better. Um, sort of the big broad category for the first set is the mechanically provoked physical urticaria. And the first one, the most common that we hear about, is dramatic graphism. Um, this the literal translation is writing on the skin. As you can see here, there's two examples. Um, the first one actually writes out dramatic graphism, and the second one, skin writing. So very good example. Did you do those? <laughs> <laughs> actually, no, but someone else sure did and took a picture and posted it on Pretty Wikipedia. <laughs> yep, there were several of uh, those that people had done on their own to show to demonstrate that. Um, so. I want to talk about dramatic graphism in terms of simple dramatic graphism, which is when you stroke the skin with mild pressure um, and there's a resultant wheel, but it, there's no pruritus in simple dramatic graphism. Um, and this sh should occur within six to seven minutes of that skin being stroked, and it lasts about 15 to 30 minutes. And this is different from symptomatic dramatic graphism, in which after stroking the skin about two to five minutes, you actually do have a linear pruritic wheel. Um, the thought is that there's sort of initial vasoconstrictive reflex. Once this fades, then you get pruritus, erythema, and the wheel formation. These lesions can last anywhere from half an hour to three hours. So again, these are more, more symptomatic and obviously they're more bothersome to patients. Um, the itching is often out of proportion to the wheel. And they can be at very minor sites of friction. Usually you see these long lines because they've scratched. And so exactly. Exactly. Uh, again, pathogenesis is really unknown. Um, the there are elevated levels of serum histamine after the wheeling episode. Uh, there's some thought that it could be IgE mediated because there have been some uh, has been some evidence that there is serum transfer. So they actually took a patient who's dramatographic and interdermally transferred uh, serum into a monkey who also then developed dramatographism. Um, so mostly this is pretty idiopathic, but um, there's some rare reports of this being triggered by an infection or even a drug. Penicillin has been reported to kind of precede the onset of dramatic graphism. So it's the most common type of physical urticaria. The prevalence of the sort of simple dramatic graphism, again, so not really symptomatic, is 2 to 5 percent in the population. And actual symptomatic dramatic graphism is, is much less common. Uh, physical, the dramatic graphism can be a part of a chronic urticaria but it's actually more severe when it's the sole form of urticaria, and there's a pretty severe form that's associated with mastocytosis. Um, in terms of sort of the process, it's actually a self-perpetuating cycle because, as we know, they have lesions, they are very pruritic, and so then they scratch the lesions, which then in dramatic graphism just produces more lesions. So once they have more lesions, they itch those. So again, it's just sort of that itch-scratch cycle, kind of like with eczema. Um, and they actually bring on more, you know, uh, lesions. Uh, in terms of diagnosis, it's actually very reproducible. Uh, we do this very frequently in clinic, so you just need a blunt object that you can stroke the skin with. We oftentimes use a tongue blade or sort of a wooden cotton swab. 
Um, and again, with the simple dermatographism, you should see a response within several minutes, and then it should resolve. So. Whenever I have a patient whose tooth complaint includes hives, when I walk into the room, the first thing I do is I scratch their skin so that it has about 10 minutes to develop, which is about when I'm ready to examine them and then I can take a look at it. Exactly. It's something that you might want to do. Yeah, it's a very good way to assess that. Um, so again, management, the first thing really, like I mentioned before, is to break that cycle. So that's why I think it's really important to be able to you know, take patients with chronic urticaria and possibly identify a subcomponent or a type of physical urticaria because if you're letting them know that they have dermatographism, then they're actually making a lot of these wheels appear and increasing their pruritus. I mean, it's very hard to not scratch, but that's something that may motivate them a little bit more to know that they're creating more of the lesions. So if you can break that cycle, you might be able to help them a lot. Um, so typical treatment, you can use first-generation antihistamines. Typically, you use high-dose sort of like dif of diphenhydramine or hydroxyzine. You use anywhere from 25 to 50 milligrams four times a day for pretty severe patients. For patients who have milder symptoms, you can really just use double or triple doses of the more uh, non-sedating or second-generation antihistamine. Of course, uh, because it's thought that there may be an IgE component, um, omelizumab has been tried, and there are some case reports where there's been su successful <clears throat> use of this drug. The most common reason for failure of treatment that I've seen is underdosing the anti. Absolutely. Which means people try to use hay fever doses, and you really do have right. to use much higher doses. Right, and a lot of the literature really suggests up to you know four times the dose in chronic urticaria, but definitely um, everything that I saw at least used double or, or triple the dose of, of typical. So. And you mentioned about a threshold for toxicity. No, I mean, I think it's kind of the typical, you know, they mentioned the same thing, especially with diphenhydramine and hydroxyzine, just keep on pushing them up until they're too sedated to where they can't function. Of course, you know, with the using antihistamines, we have to worry about urinary retention and flushing and all the sort of symptoms they may get. But most patients that I've seen have seemed to be on multiple different, you know, antihistamines at the same time and don't experience any of those symptoms. So they seem to develop tolerance over time. Exactly. Time. They still need to be warned about operating machinery and driving cars, but um, um, if you start somebody out on 50 milligrams of hydroxyzine QID, they will be in coma. Exactly. So you have to start and start build early. up as they develop tolerance to the side effects. And much like our chronic urticaria patients, which is again probably how you're going to find most of these patients, you know, it's that trial and error method where you're starting something. Um, and as an overall general, they, when you talk about physical urticaria, they talk about using diphenhydramine and hydroxyzine initially and then sort of switching them out. But like I said, as we go through them, you'll see that really certain physical urticaria respond better. So you kind of can pick and choose based on what type of physical urticaria that you think they have and start with those rather than doing a standard thing for every patient. I think you're pretty safe on just moving slowly. It's not like, you know, in PICU where you get these kids who overdose on, you know, <laughs> right. like you're going to have your patients start to complain, you know, eventually of dry mouth, maybe some urinary retention right. early on as you slowly titrate right up. Exactly. I think I've only seen one case and it was sort of a, yeah, that kind of acute toxicity mm -hmm. of kids just drinking a bunch of Benadryl and so it really doesn't happen even at these doses because even though they're high, they, you know, are building up that tolerance. I had a patient who came in with someone outside, put her on like 75 milligrams four times a day of mm -hmm. Benadryl and mm -hmm. she was like drugs, even when she was in the clinic. See, and I just had a patient recently who was taking that much. She was taking 100 four times a day, and, and no, no, no change. <laughs> so it's, it's so variable, and I think that's why you have to kind of talk to these patients frequently and see where they are and how they're tolerating everything, and that's something important. You know, we tell everybody antihistamines are relatively safe, but I think it's still important to ask and always check uh, what they're actually doing. So the next one is, um, again, mechanically provoked is delayed pressure urticaria. So this is actually sort of a misnomer because it's more deep swelling that resembles angioedema than it is urticaria. Uh, it can occur anywhere on the body, but it especially is in the palms, soles, and buttocks. And the reason for that is because you can acquire it from sustained pressure from activities such as walking, sitting, carrying objects in your hand, holding something up to the body. You can also see it with uh, tight clothing, so a lot of patients will complain of urticaria around waistband areas. Um, it's actually also a little bit different in that patients describe more pain, stinging, and burning rather than as much pruritus. Um, the typical sort of onset is two to eight hours after the stimulus. 
Um, most places say around that kind of four to six hour mark is when you're going to start seeing symptoms after they've had certain pressure. Um, and then it lasts 24 to 72 hours. And that's something to sort of make a note of because, again, any time we think about greater than 24 hours, we always are thinking about arterial vasculitis or other underlying issues because we think, typically think that hives go away before then. Um, and like I said, probably because this is a deeper <coughs> swelling rather than just urticaria, it does last longer, so that's something to, to kind of keep in mind. Um, they can have systemic symptoms, things such as malaise, fevers, arthralgias, headache, leukocytosis. <coughs> so um, oftentimes I don't think we know that much about those and really consider it when they're complaining of all sorts of other things. And they may not even put it all together as happening at the same time, but um, that's something to, to ask about. It's really pretty rare um, overall, but can coexist in up to 40% of chronic urticaria. Uh, in terms of diagnosis, you basically attach either sandbags or jugs of fluid that weigh anywhere from 5 to 15 pounds. You attach them to a strap and then put them on a patient's shoulder or on their thigh for 10 to 15 minutes. And you know, several hours later, if they have a linear wheel, then that's a positive test. So kind of just reproducing that pressure sensation. <coughs> Uh, overall, delayed pressure urticaria it persists for many years. It's sort of a difficult one to take care of because they really don't respond to antihistamines very well. And again, probably because there's so much more underlying and deep tissue swelling. Um, they may require systemic steroids, and sort of the best approach is just to do the lowest dose of systemic steroids that they will tolerate. That will at least give them significant improvement, not necessarily resolution, uh, because again, we always worry about the side effects of, of systemic steroids. So um, the authors actually in many of the study or many of the papers suggest about 15 to 25 milligrams every other day. Um, but again, getting them down, which is still a large amount, um, so really getting them down as, uh, as far as you can would be better. That's kind of the exception because we usually don't recommend long-term steroids for pretty Right, time. right. Well, and again, this delayed pressure, I think, again, that's another point. The delayed pressure urticaria just doesn't respond very well. So it's one that you, it's probably one of the only ones that really steroids was more highly recommended, even though they continue to warn about side effects and how we don't like using them. I um, thought this was kind of interesting. There uh, was a randomized control trial with patients with delayed pressure urticaria, and they had three arms of it. They had one group of patients that just received placebo, one that got desloratadine, and then one that got desloratadine and Montelukast. Um, Overall, in the patients who received some drug, they showed that they had a reduction in the mean diameter of the wheel, so when they repeated testing, that it wasn't as big. Um, and then the patients who were on both uh, desloratadine and uh, Montelukast had fewer episodes and overall reduced symptoms. There are, haven't been a lot of other studies with Montelukast and other antihistamines. So um, we're not really sure whether or not other things would work just as well, but I presume that probably you could try that. But again, we oftentimes in some of our adult patients or even in pediatric patients that add on singular and aren't sure really if it makes an effect, um, but Montelukast may be um, helpful in the in delayed pressure to carry us and other sort of indication. Did it mention anything about frequency of symptoms or number of symptoms? Yeah, they had the damage. Right, mm -hmm. it's just at an overall kind of mean diameter. So, um, and again, there have been some case reports with omalizumab in delayed pressure urticaria as well. I think it's probably been tried for, for most types, so you're always going to see a few reports. Uh, there is a subset sort of called immediate pressure urticaria, um, and the high is basically just like delayed pressure urticaria, other than the highs develop within one to two minutes of pressure. Um, it's really less rare, and it's seen in patients who have hypereosinophilic syndrome, and they also tend to have dramatic graphism. So it's really kind of a certain subset. The next big category is thermally provoked. And the first one is cholinergic urticaria. And this picture is not that great in seeing the details, but you can kind of see the sort of smaller, fine urticaria there. And again, I think that's another good example of something that doesn't really fit the classic of what we think of these big plaques and um, the verathema and, and wheel. So they are different in that they're small and punctate. They're usually about two to four millimeters. They are maculopapular, um, and they usually have a large erythematous layer around them. Initially, they're usually clustered and mostly located on the upper trunk and arms, but they can spread distally. They can also become very confluent and look just like angioedema. 
some patients say that they have tingling, itching, or burning before they actually have the hive, um, something that might kind of be an onset. Um, there's usually severe pruritus with cholinergic urticaria, and if there's actually a, a sort of name, it's called cholinergic pruritus. So they have terrible pruritus and don't have any lesions at all, which I think is kind of interesting because we're always looking for something at the time of uh, symptoms. They usually last about 90 minutes. Uh, the stimuli is anything that really raises the core body temperature. Um, things like hot showers, exercise, sweating, anxiety, other emotions, eating spicy food, really just a sudden temperature change. The interesting thing, though, is that when there's endogenous <coughs> pyrogens that cause fever, that they don't bring on the cholinergic and urticaria. So um, they can have uh, other extra dermatologic symptoms as well, hypotension, wheezing, abdominal pain, and they can even have syncope due to sort of mast cell mediator induced end organ sensitivity. Um, and then some patients have actually what you would consider cholinergic symptoms, so lacrimation, salivation, diarrhea that is associated with these symptoms. So it's, it's caused by an increased production of acetylcholine? Uh-huh. So again, we know that there are serum histamine levels that are elevated, but um, the thought is that the, when the body temperature is raised, um, it activates the cholinergic system, and that integrates the sweat glands, so then there's more acetylcholine, and that, for whatever reason, our mast cells are sort of hypersensitive to this acetylcholine, um, and it leads to that outpouring. Um, some other thoughts about pathogenesis is that it could be IgE-mediated to human sweat, They've actually had patients who they've done immediate skin prep testing to their own like diluted sweat, and they've had wheel and flare development. So, mm. yeah. um, do we know what in the sweat does it? No. Um, it it comprises about thirty percent of all physical and five percent of all chronic urticaria. About 15% of the general population will have some type of cholinergic urticaria at some time in their life. Uh, it's most common in sort of younger patients that are maybe 20s to 30s. Um, you can actually do one of the tests that they talked about was a methacholine intradermal testing, and you take methacholine of choline that's diluted in saline um, and inject it, and they'll basically have a wheel, and then they'll have sort of satellite region, satellite lesions, and that can be positive in about 50% of patients. Unfortunately, methacholine um, in this form is not approved in the U.S. for this use, so that's something we would do. Um, probably the easiest way that it's done is that they reproduce the lesions by having the patient exercise. So again, this is sort of a sweating and heat type of thing, so you would want them to exercise in a room where the temperature is 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, they've also suggested you could have them be in a wet suit or a plastic occlusive suit. Um, and interestingly, patients who they've had exercise in a plastic occlusive suit actually had a significant decrease in their FEV1. So they're not really sure why that happened, um, whether it's just a factor of the circulatory mediators that are going on at the time of the, the cholinergic release. So, um, and then I guess a little bit simpler test is that they have them submerge one or two arms in water that's heated to 40 degrees Celsius. Um, in terms of management, a cooling off period may be helpful. So if you can get the core body temperature back down um, to a normal range, the patients you can actually abort the cholinergic urticaria or help sort of resolve it faster. Um, <coughs> cholinergic urticaria particularly responds well to hydroxazine, and so you kind of push the upper limits, 100 to 200 milligrams per day in divided doses. Um, they've also used the tyrosine, 20 milligrams a day, again, doubling the dose and ciproheptadine has been helpful. You would think that because they're cholinergic and they have symptoms of colon, you know, cholinergic release and things like that, that anticholinergics would help, but there's actually no role and no, no proven um, help with that. <coughs> They've used Danzol, which is an anabolic steroid, and the thought was that patients with cholinergic urticaria have, don't have enough um, protease inhibitors, and so that this aids in that, but really because of the side effects and things really isn't used much. Um, and then again, because they thought that the, it was related to an IgE-mediated reaction to sweat, they tried omalizumab in some patients, and that has helped. That would only be if it's long-term persistent, though, because it wouldn't help for acute. Yeah, mm -hmm. Absolutely.
So a word about exercise-induced anaphylaxis, because um, it's really hard to distinguish exercise-induced exercise -induced anaphylaxis from cholinergic urticaria when the cholinergic urticaria has those systemic symptoms, like I mentioned, the wheezing and the hypotension. They can look very similar. So this is just a, a little chart that kind of differentiates the two. So they both can happen during or after exercise. They both can have urticaria and angioedema or other symptoms of anaphylaxis. Uh, a way to look at the lesions, again, cholinergic, they're the, tip, the smaller wheels, the two to four millimeters, and the exercise-induced anaphylaxis have the more typical urticaria that are larger in 10 to 15 millimeters. Um, in cholinergic urticaria, it's almost always with exercise, as well as the other sort of heated uh, stimuli, like the hot showers and sweating, whereas exercise-induced anaphylaxis doesn't have to be with every time they exercise. It doesn't have to be with the same amount of exercise. Um, and it doesn't occur with those other stimuli, so you really need to ask them all the different things that trigger their symptoms. <clears throat> and again, cholinergic urticaria is related to the core body temperature, so it's an increase of 0.7 degrees Celsius that is thought to bring on the onset, whereas exercise-induced anaphylaxis has no relationship to core body temperature. I uh, really don't know the mechanism of exercise-induced anaphylaxis but we do know that there are some precipitating foods. So the common foods are celery, apples, chickens, sort of some weird foods. It really can be any food, though. So um, it's best if uh, patients with exercise-induced urticaria or exercise-induced anaphylaxis, I'm sorry, avoid eating two hours before they exercise. They actually should have an EpiPen um, and make sure that someone is exercising with them so that uh, if they were to have symptoms, they would be close by to get medical attention. So. <clears throat> the next um, of the thermally provoked is local heat urticaria. And just like it sounds, um, local contact is heat. So these are some examples. Um, it's typically pr pretty pruritic, but there's also a lot of burning. Um, you see the wheel and flare within minutes, and it's just right at the site of contact. So warm bath. I think if you apply too much heat, then the burning could just be from a burn. Heat. Yep. To think about that. Um, hair dryers, hot foods, or drinking um, hot liquids can be provoke this. Um, again, like with many of the other um, physical urticarias, you can actually have systemic symptoms. Um, and it mostly is when you have a large portion of the body that's affected. So again, a smaller area you may not, but if a whole area, I guess, comes in contact, so probably more like getting in a hot bath or something like that. Uh, they can have headache, headache, dizziness, syncope, abdominal cramps, wheezing, all those things. It's more common in women and atopic individuals. However, it's still very rare. There is a familial variant where they have more of a delayed type, and they basically, instead of having within minutes, it's an hour and a half to two hours after the warm stimulus is applied, and they have persistence for about six to ten hours. Um, and interestingly, those patients have problems when they're like intentionally sunbathing, but sunlight in general doesn't affect them, whereas in the immediate type, sunlight can be a problem. <coughs> um, local heat urticaria in general is very temperature dependent, anywhere from 39 to 56 degrees Celsius. Um, it is not dependent on the wavelengths of light, however. And in order to diagnose this, you can apply a test tube of warm water at 44 degrees Celsius for about four to five minutes. Um, and you should see some reaction there. You can also use a towel that's soaked in, in warm water as well. There's really not a lot of management um, that's very effective for local heat urticaria. Obviously, avoidance would be a big thing. Um, again, you can use first and second generation antihistamine. They've actually shown that doxepin may be more helpful than chloroquine. Um, a patient has definitely been desensitized, so they kind of have them have repeated immersion in hot baths, but you do have to do that with caution because, again, the more the body surface area that's affected, the more likely they are to have systemic symptoms. Can you desensitize one arm and not the other? <laughs> Potentially could do certain areas. They did talk about doing, like, areas where they have more problems. So if it's just an area. Arm, but then the arm still reacts. Yeah. So be fascinating yeah. to see if that could or maybe a portion at a time, you know, dip in the foot yeah. and then do the leg, and that way you don't bring on the systemic symptoms. <laughs> um, so shifting gears from the warm stuff to the cold urticaria. So cold urticaria is um, 
are made up of, they're about 3 to 5 percent of all physical aortic areas, and there's multiple different types. Um, there's not a lot known about each individual one, so we'll just kind of briefly touch on them, not really go through a lot of um, details. But the one, the biggest problem one is primary acquired essential cold urticaria, is the other name for it. And you get the classic wheel and flare, but you also may have swelling of the lips and tongue. So it typically, again, is pretty immediate, a couple of minutes after applying a solid food, a solid or a fluid that's cold. Um, you can have a spontaneous resolution within 30 minutes to an hour after the skin is rewarmed. And once again, they can have um, systemic symptoms um, if a large part of the skin is um, exposed. So again, immersion in, a, in cold water can actually trigger vasodilation and anaphylaxis. It's more common in children and young adults. Um, ingestion of cold drinks, getting in cold water, and actually meds injected at a low temperature. There's been a report of, uh, intraoperatively, a patient who received a medication that was at a low temperature and had hypotension um, and wheezing and had a reaction. So something that we don't really think about, but uh, anesthesiologists, I suppose, should, should consider that. Um, you know, our allergy <coughs> extracts are kept refrigerated and Sometimes when we inject those, they're still pretty cold, so that could be something. Yeah. It's usually about 6 degrees Celsius, though, so it's pretty, mm, pretty, pretty cold. Pretty cold. Yeah. Um, you need to test for cryoglobulins and just rule out any other systemic disease. Um, but the actual test for diagnosis is called the ice cube test. And you basically apply a cold ice cube to the forearm for about five minutes. Within a few minutes, the patient should have some pruritus. And actually, probably about five or ten minutes after, the ice cube has been removed, the skin is rewarming, and that's what leads to a specific urticaria in the shape of the ice cube. Um, it can be life-threatening because of swimming, so patients who have issues with uh, acquired cold urticaria should avoid swimming alone and possibly just even immersion in swimming at all. Um, you can use first and second generation antihistamines, but again, this is one that um, sort of ciproheptidine seems to work a little bit better for, and the doses can range from 8 to 16 milligrams in divided doses. Um, for patients who are undergoing surgery and you're worried about the injection, the cold medication injection, uh, they can use steroids and some other combination therapy. Again, desensitization, so immersion in this time in cold baths is an option, but like I said before, if you get a large portion of the body that's exposed, you may have systemic symptoms, so it has to be done with caution. Um, so, secondary acquired ur cold urticaria, um, it's about 5% of the cold urticaria. Basically, it's a little bit different in that the wheel is perforic and persistent. So, to have this, they actually do need to have something else going on. So, cryoglobulin, cold agglutinin, um, an underlying disorder. The cryofibrinogen can be present if they have things like hepatitis B, C, or mono. Um, but the treatment is essentially the same as a primary um, cold urticaria. You just, of course, is more persistent. And then familial cold urticaria, it's actually also known as familial cold autoinflammatory syndrome. It's a pretty rare syndrome that has been um, inherited through an autosomal dominant pattern. And there's two types. There's an immediate type where they have burning and erythematous papules within 30 minutes to three hours. And again, these last from 24 to 48 hours, so a little bit more atypical than what we think of for urticaria. Um, as many others, they can have headaches, arthralgias, fevers. They can actually have leukocytosis and conjunctivitis. So oftentimes people confuse this with an infection that's going on because their systemic symptoms seem like that. There's also a delayed type, and they basically have urticaria and angioedema. And it's in the area of cold exposure um, and it, again, comes on later, but it resolves in 9 to 18 hours. So it comes on later and resolves sooner. And they actually have a negative ice cube test. Um, they don't really respond to antihistamines very well, so the biggest thing for them is the avoidance of prolonged exposure to cold air. So they don't respond locally to the ice cube test, so what kind of cold brings it on then? They do cold, cold air, so they do cold air challenges, it's actually. stomach internally as opposed to cutaneous. So, and that's why some of them get more angioedema. But yeah, it's cold air exposure, so you just kind of do put them in cold rooms and stuff in terms of doing challenges. It's got to be frustrating when they come in and with a history of cold urticaria and you say, wow, I'm going to show 
Yeah, and you do this ice cream thing, and then it's negative. Yeah. Oh, but, now what do I? Right. And the familial touch is also, you know, much more rare, so. Though I did have one family where it was familial. Oh. And the mother had it also, and she brought her daughter in and said, well, the ice cream test will be next. She knew about it because it's oh. also oh. Wow. Yeah. Very good. Very interesting. Um, do we know what gene causes it? Um, actually, it's similar to um, the Muckle-Wells syndrome, so the genetic abnormality, I can't remember which chromosome it's on. Um, Muckle-Wells has urticaria, amyloidosis, and deafness. And so it actually can respond to a therapy in a Kinra that you use for that. It's an interleukin-1 antagonist that binds to the IL-1 receptor. So um, it's that same gene, the same genetic mutation. Hmm. Um, cold-induced cholinergic urticaria. So just like, sounds just like cholinergic urticaria, except for that it's cold-induced. So basically instead of exercising in a hot place, it's when they're like on, exercising with AC on, or if they're running in a wintry day. And it's pretty generalized rather than localized. Uh, this is something that you could think of in a patient if they said that they really just had symptoms in the winter time they came in. Um, you should consider that because it can happen. And then cold-dependent dermatographism, so sounds just like dermatographism, the wheel and flare, if the skin is scratched, and then chilled. So it, nobody really talks more about this as to why it would then chill the skin if it's just in a room that's really cold, I suppose. Um, it seems kind of odd to go to actually chill the skin in any other way. Um, but they don't have any dermatographism in a warm environment. Um, the ice cube test will be negative. A cold challenge will be negative. Um, so they just have it when it's cold. And they can use double or triple dosing of antihistamine. So when you do these physical urticaria tests, you kind of have to do combinations of them also. Because if one's negative, it doesn't mean that's different not orders, it. too, so it's more permutations. It's really complicated. It is. And then localized cold urticaria. So again, like local heat urticaria, it's basically just that the site of contact. You get these punctate hives. Um, you may, some patients have predisposed conditions, but some don't have any precursor to the onset of this. Um, and this is what you would do, as, it's a cold stimulus test. So you, you use the ice cube test, but instead of it forming a wheel in the shape of the ice cube, it just has areas of wheel around there, and they're not confluent. Hmm. So it just looks a little bit different, and that can sort of tell you that it's more of a localized issue um, rather than just a primary acquired cold urticaria. Um, and then like you can satellite lesions? Mm -hmm, just around that still localized to that area, it just doesn't form the exact shape. Um, and they can do, you can do cold challenges to assess the severity of this. Um, and then systemic cold urticaria. So again, now it's generalized, the same symptoms, the urticaria, angioedema, pruritus, 20 minutes after exposure. It can happen through clothing, so covered and uncovered parts of the body. It's not necessarily related to activity, and it can be life-threatening because, again, response. So. It's not very rare. It's very rare. Um, you can't do the ice test in this one, so you'd have to do a cold challenge. But hydroxyzine and ciproheptidine seem to work pretty well for this. And the final sort of big category is miscellaneous provoked. Solar urticaria. Um, so the picture here of the shoulder fits pre and post sun exposure. And it's really just 15 minutes uh, through a glass window because you don't get complete um, isolation of all the ultraviolet lights, it's just UVB. So patients typically sound kind of like a sunburn, they have tingling and pruritus, um, and then they have erythematous wheel and flare. It's within minutes and it can last seven out, several hours. Um, they also can have similar uh, systemic symptoms, again, when large areas are, are exposed. There's, this is actually thought to have somewhat of a, an immunologic etiology. They think that there's a precursor molecule that gets activated when there's certain wavelengths of light, and then that becomes a photoallergen. <clears throat> it's not very common, it, but it does occur more in women and patients in their 30s and 40s. And as opposed to some of the heat urticaria, like local heat urticaria, this actually occurs in healthy and non-atopic individuals. Um, it can be familial. There's a genetic abnormality in protoporphyrin um, 9 metabolism in one particular uh, familial disorder. Um, and basically, this ends up acting as a photosensitizer. 
there are six different types, and they categorize them based on the wavelength of light that causes the lesions. Um, and you can diagnose it by either exposing them to a small area, um, or exposing a small area of their skin to natural sunlight, or you can do photo testing where they specifically do visible light, UVA, and, and UVB, and see how they respond. Obviously, you want the patients to wear solar protective clothing, use high potency SPF lotions. Um, there's really not a great role for antihistamines and immunosuppressives. There have been a, many other things that have been tried. They actually have used plasmapheresis because, again, they thought that there's a photoallergen, so you could potentially remove that from the plasma. Um, there's a UVA rush hardening regimen where you basically expose them to graded doses of UVA light for like an hour every day, sort of a, a fast desensitization process. And most of those patients um, actually get the tolerance. So, so. Um, I had one of these patients. Also, and uh, it was very difficult because so it was an adolescent girl, and uh, whenever she would get in the car, she couldn't be in the car very long because she'd have reactions through the car windows, and it was it was a real problem because no matter where she went, there was always some sun exposure, uh, and we were able to reproduce it with an ultraviolet light. But what we did to, to determine the actual wavelength is we had a spectrophotometer in the lab that's used to measure. Uh, absorption, uh, UV absorption of, of chemicals, and uh, we took the patient's blood with uh, with basophils in it and different test tubes of the blood and put it into the spectrophotometer and exposed it to different wavelengths and then histo did a histamine release measurement and we were able to identify one wavelength range of ultraviolet that caused the histamine to be released from the basophils. Right. It was really interesting. Yeah, and that's what they talk about, how they <clears throat> categorize them didn't help us treat the patient. The patient <laughs> was miserable, and none of the treatments were very effective. I don't know whatever happened to her. Eventually, they just stopped coming. Yeah. Uh, some patients have used IVIG, um, omalizumab, again, because it's thought to be sort of an immunologic etiology and possibly IG-mediated. Um, Cyclophorin has been used. But typically, these patients have persistence for years. Um, maybe 20 to 30 percent of them have permanent remission, but most of them, this is you know, as opposed to other urticarias where they may last 10 years, these patients tend to have sort of more chronic, um, long-lasting. Do sunscreens help, or does it really depend on the wavelength? That's yeah, I mean, it does. Obviously, you encourage that. You want them to use the highest SPF they can get. But like you said, it's so hard because it does depend on each different category and type. And you have to figure that out based on the six types, like which wavelengths actually, which sort of range of wavelengths actually affect them. So. They might end up just having to have certain lifestyle, to live like a vampire, you know, exactly. work night shift, and okay. so on. And, and then if where you work has ultraviolet, uh, like fluorescent lights, that could also produce some ultraviolet. Right. Right. And then aquagenic urticaria. So can basically just water contact. It can be of any temperature. They pretty much have the pruritic wheels immediately or within minutes. And these are actually tiny perifollicular lesions, so again, not the bigger hives. They last for about half an hour to an hour. They're mostly confined to the upper body, but they can occur on, on all parts. Um, they at least, though, usually spare the palms and the soles. Other stimuli can be sweat, saliva, and tears. In terms of the pathogenesis, they, uh, actually the serum histamine levels in these patients are very variable, so they're not necessarily high after each wheeling episode, as in some of the other urticarias. Um, the thoughts are that you know water may be a solvent for the antigen, such as sebum, or just that these patients have increased permeability to water, and so then they have increased size in their wheel. Um, there is some suggestion that it may be a part of the cholinergic pathway, but um, other studies, and they, they did this because they um ended up um, having an effect on the wheel, but other Studies went back and looked, and made it the methicoline interdermal that we had discussed for cholinergic urticaria. It wasn't positive, and they couldn't reverse the wheel with atropine like you gain in patients with cholinergic urticaria. So, not really sure where that's going now. Again, it's very, very rare. Less than 50 cases reported in the literature. I should have reported mine then if it was that rare. That's right. Um, actually, Middleton's um, back in 2009 said there were 13 cases. This is the I had one that was so that was bona fide. It was a male adolescent who was at one of those. Uh, uh, he, he was actually in an institution because he had emotional issues, and every time he would take a shower, 
uh, he would welt up. It was miserable. But he, he wouldn't develop the, the itching until about ten minutes in, five to ten minutes into the mm -hmm. shower. So if he took the shower really fast and then dried off, he was okay. But if it lasted more than about five minutes, then he became intensely itchy to the point that it was really uncomfortable and he didn't want to take showers. Because you wonder, well, how can you be allergic to water? Because if you're made of water, it doesn't make any sense. But uh, you know, we decided to do allergy testing with this patient. And you know, it's not really a prick test. It's just contact. It's, it's basically, it's not percutaneous. It's epicutaneous. It's on top of the skin. And we took little uh, uh, swat, it's not cotton, but gauze pads and soaked them in water, took another one and soaked it in saline to see if it was the salt concentration that made the difference. We took one that was warmed up so that it was body temperature instead of cold, put a little plastic over it to keep it warm in case it was colder to carry instead of just, just water. And then we had one that was just a dry one that didn't have any water to say as a negative control in it. And the patient really did welt up in the shape of the gauze where the water was located, both the saline, the plain water, the warm water but not the negative control. And it was very clear. I took pictures of it. It was, it was really fascinating. Yeah. Difficult to treat. I mean, we tried everything, antihistamines, uh, Montelukast. Uh, nothing that we did really made any difference. Uh, ultimately, the patient just ended up having to take really quick showers. Mm -hmm. It's really frustrating. Yeah. I don't know. Have you seen aquagenic urticaria? Yeah, I've seen a bunch of physical urticaria, including that kind. Uh, that era when I was a fellow at the NIH and Alan Kaplan used to bring all these cold and and physical light, heat, all these ones. Uh, some of them just turned out to be bogus stories, but some of them were real. So yeah. uh, what, there's a, not to go f so far off track, but there was um, a researcher called Jacques Benveniste from Pasteur Institute in France worked with uh, Larry Lichtenstein, was a collaborator of his 20 years ago. There was a famous series of experiments that were reported in Nature that were set up by the editor of Nature. Because this guy, Ben Venice, claimed that if you had IgE, bona fide IgE in an allergen in a water solution, and then diluted that solution, the water had a memory of the IgE allergen interaction. And you could then add that water to basophils and mast cells and get histamine release, even though the concentration of the IgE on a chemical basis was too low to affect that at the cellular level. And these experiments, this is in the early to mid-80s, there's a bunch of them published. They were demonstrated, allegedly, by the nature editors as being bogus, because essentially they were just looking at fluctuations in the baselines for the way these cells work. Sounds like homeopathy. Yeah, I, but I was going to say, this these experiments have been held up as a model of homeopathy. And their explanation was that the water was educated by having the molecules of IgE and the allergen in the water. So it changed the water molecules to the point where it then could activate the mast cells to release uh, histamine. A totally, you know, totally bogus, bogus uh, construct. but. But this is a real condition, and yeah. they can. So these patients with physical urticaria, I mean, there's a bunch of them who have vibratory urticaria. We need to have them. Come You'll in. get to that. Yeah. 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 Yep. It is interesting about the salinity because they had some patients who <coughs> um, initially responded to seawater and salt water, but then later yeah. developed the issue, so it kind of fluctuates. Some people call it fresh water or not, but eventually any water does affect them. Um, so testing, you apply a compress that's soaked in 37 degree. Um, water that's 37 degrees Celsius for about 30 minutes. What about just drinking water and ingesting it? That, that, that doesn't, that's not, that doesn't treat Yeah, so it's not a, because again, they don't really have systemic stuff. It's just sort of a localized, I mean, or, you know, on the skin. Um, so you can use sort of barriers such as petrolatum um, to pre the skin whenever they're going to engage in any kind of like showering or, or any contact with water. Uh, you can use antihistamines. There's about five or six patients that they reported good um, results of propanolol, anywhere using from 10 to 40 milligrams daily. They don't really discuss, you know, what they propose mechanism and how this works is. Um, and then some patients, they can get the wave, like ultra, ultraviolet radiation therapy, and that um, may help. 
And so, yeah, just a side note on vibratory angioedema. Again, it's not really an urticaria, but it is a physical stimulus. I thought I would mention it. Um, they basically get local erythema, severe paritis, and edema of the skin and sub tissue. It happens within minutes, and it peaks about four to six hours, and it lasts about 24 hours. Um, again, it's with repetitive vibratory stimuli, examples of massaging, riding a motorcycle or horse, using a jackhammer, mowing the lawn. Good way to get out of some of the household chores. Yeah, I like that. Idea. <laughs> um, they can have systemic symptoms such as headache and generalized erythema. It's pretty rare. There are hereditary uh, forms that are autosomal dominant, and they're also acquired forms. Um, to test it, you can apply a vibratory source for about four to five minutes. A lot of people will use the lab vortex to do this. Um, so really, the biggest thing is having them avoid vibratory stimuli. For some people, if that's in their profession, it may be hard to do. Um, but hopefully you can accomplish that with most patients. Um, you can use antihistamine. And there's actually a patient who developed tolerance after doing challenges. So basically did twice daily vibration challenges. Um, and then every like five to seven days sort of re-desensitized by doing these challenges for a couple of days. And is so. it systemic? I mean, if you desensitize one arm, is the other arm protected? Or is it just vocal? They didn't specifically say which one she did. I would want to know. Yeah. yeah. Um, several of the European groups, allergy, dermatology, sort of urticaria uh, experts, put together this uh, sort of con consensus of the definitions of physical urticaria and their diagnostic testing. And they go through this is kind of a good form to use in clinic in terms of, you know, it tells you up at the top, I don't know if you can see very well here, but um, it tells you the test site, so where you should apply, you know, whatever you're going to do, what type of test you should do, and then you record, you know, how long you should wait to see the symptoms, and you can put whether there's a positive wheel, whether the patient's experiencing pruritus, and then it tells you, depending on positive and negative there, what you should do, and you should go next and test their threshold. So this is for the common types of urticaria. And then on the next page, this is their threshold stuff, so you would, you know, for example, for a dramatic graphism, you would do it again and do it at 20 minutes, you know, 20, 36, 60. So you're kind of seeing what their threshold is in terms of what they can tolerate. And that, again, may help patients to know, you know, how much they can do, um, you know, the, the wavelengths and things like that. I remember doing all of those when somebody would come in and say, well, when I scratch, I get welts, and then we would do all of those. And, and it always seemed unnecessary to me to test for cold or to carry it if there's no history of, Right. cold and these symptoms. It yeah. seems like you test for the kind of urticaria that the symptoms suggest the patient is likely Absolutely. to have. If they haven't got a clue, if they just get hives and want to know is it physical, I, I suppose Absolutely. this would be a good approach. Right. And again, just keep in mind that patients may have multiple physical urticarias at a time, so it would be good. You know, they may only recognize the very obvious one if they're an avid, you know, sports person or playing or junior, they might know that they definitely get it with that activity, but they may not know the subtler parts of it. So mm. um, that's something yeah. to think about. So just in summary, um, physical urticarias can code physical chronic urticaria, and that can actually cause acute outbreaks. Um, like I said, they can have more than one type of physical urticaria. So many of them have systemic symptoms, and that's something I don't think I knew as much about, so something to really take into consideration and ask about. Um, a lot of them are very rare. There are a lot of fam familial variants of the physical urticaria, and these seem to be more delayed um, than the immediate type in those situations. Um, antihistamines and avoidance are the first line of therapy, but again, depending on the type of physical urticaria, there may be um, more effective therapies, and again, omolizumab is, is always looked at, and, and chronic urticaria has been helpful. So uh, we'll go through the CME questions quickly. Um, which type of urticaria is frequently confused with exercise-induced anaphylaxis? D. D. Cholinergic urticaria. Okay. D. And which is the best test for aquagenic urticaria? D. D. Yep. 30 minutes, 37 degrees. And which type of urticaria is a particularly difficult problem because of the poor response to antihistamine? D. Yep. Delayed pressure urticaria. And because of its persistence overall, it's very difficult. Okay. All right. Yeah, but it can be like that. It's yep. A very frustrating problem. Yep. And that's it. There. Well, that was really great. Thank you. Um, are there any uh, comments or questions from anyone? Any of have any comments or thoughts? 
Any thoughts? Physical air to carry? One of the things with blade pressure is that, um, I mean, I, I found that there's a, a sort of a link uh, to aspirin sensitivity. So uh, that's a particular group that I think does pretty well if you want to try singular in that group. Uh, and um, part of from all the other physical ones, delayed pressure, you know, with uh, bra strap and belt line and a variety of other things where you're likely to take it up in terms of more of the everyday aspects of living. So, uh, you know, those are both soft calls, but uh, whenever I have a patient where there's a consideration for delayed pressure, I try to see if there's some aspirin sensitivity and I, I think a little bit more along the lines of singular. And that's actually one of the randomized control trials that I talked about. They had patients on an antihistamine and on a glue cast, and the ones that were on both did better. Yeah. I've always been intrigued by the fact that you don't have it, and then you acquire it. And what is it that causes you to acquire it when you didn't have it before? There's got to be some event or some inciting factor that does that, either a viral infection or an allergic reaction to, to a drug. Or I've seen urticaria start after somebody had a systemic reaction to a drug, for example. And yep. six months afterwards, they continue to be dermographic. The dermographic eventually wears off and goes away, and then they no longer have the, right. the problem. But, but I'm just intrigued by that because the mechanism of how a, an inciting factor can lead to six months of physical urticaria is hard for me to understand how that, how that happens. I've always wondered if these aren't the symptom more than the disease, like there's some chronic urticaria and they just have different triggers that promote their symptoms, but not the underlying thing. Like I think, sometimes we think of it as the underlying thing, but I always thought of it as chronic urticaria with various triggers, mm -hmm. and their chronic urticaria cause can be X, Y, or Z, you know. Yeah. It gives to me more sense. Um, and I guess it just depends on how you, de you define it, you know, in terms of chronic urticaria. Some patients can still have this on and off and may not have, you know, symptoms multiple days a week and that kind of thing. Uh, Obviously, but, yeah. a condition that is common enough to be frustrating and uh, still somewhat mysterious. So, room for more research. Well, we're going to stop there. Thank you, Dr. Argo, for this illuminating presentation. Uh, why don't we take a two-minute break, if everyone needs that, and then we'll resume, and Dr. Rosenwasser will talk with us about particle deposition in small airways. This is Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Nursing Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.